Zephyr Hill City Council meeting of Monday, June 10th, 2024. It is 6 p.m. And Ms. Hillman, can I have the roll call, please? Yes, sir. Ken Burgess. Here. Charles, Charles Proctor. Mayor Monson. Here. Lance Smith. Here. Jody Wilkinson. Here. Steve Spina. Here. Matthew Maggart. Here. William Poe. Here. All right. I'd like to welcome everybody tonight. We've got an action-packed agenda that you should enjoy. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. I could ask you to uh, silence your cell phones right now, and any citizen wants to make a comment on anything, uh, there will be a time to do that at the end of the meeting, or you can comment on items uh, as we go along. Uh, you just need to sign up with Ms. Hillman, that, uh, and you'll have three minutes to uh, speak. So at this time, we're going to have the invocation, and Pastor Denise Lay of the First Presbyterian Church, and then we'll follow that with the pledge. And I want to apologize for not being a little bit more dressed, but I just came from our meal program, and we serve about 500 meals to our hungry friends and neighbors in this community, and so thank you for that. And I want to take just one second to thank the sanitation workers in this town who work so hard. They are exceptional, and we have many times had to call for some special things from them. And they are so professional and so kind and so friendly that you just need to know they're awesome. And so I thank you for that. Let's pray. Loving God, as we um, are here at the beginning of this city council meeting, we ask for your wisdom, for your guidance, for your courage to make good decisions. We thank you that you have invited us to be a part of this community in this time and in this place. We recognize with gratitude what a privilege it is to be here and to be a part of this Zephyr Hills community and to serve in this way. We thank you for our council members and all those who serve this city in various ways. We are forever grateful to them. And we ask your blessing on this beautiful city and on its residents and on all those who seek to make this a better place to live. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Pledge of allegiance to the of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Pastor Lay, for those kind comments about the sanitation department. And uh, Shane, well, I'm sure we'll pass along, pass those along. Um, first up, we have the mayor, and she has uh, several items for us, so I'll turn things. it over to the mayor at this time. Do we have anyone from um, representing the national small cities in the audience? If not, I just want to recognize that we have a proclamation for them, um, for our, our small cities. So uh, we'll pass by that, and then we'll have our Parks and Rec team come up, and we'll do our Juneteenth proclamation. Okay, whereas, let me make sure I have the right thing. Okay, whereas on September 22nd, 1862, President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation notifying the states in rebellion against the Union that if they did not cease their rebellion and return to the Union by January 1st, 1863, he would declare their slaves forever free. This proclamation was ignored by those states that succeeded from the Union. And whereas June 19th, 1865, referred to as Juneteenth, is considered the date when the last slaves of America were freed. And whereas emancipation in Florida was pro proclaimed in Tallahassee on May 20th, 1865, and for this reason, Floridians traditionally celebrate Emancipation Day on May 20th. And whereas Juneteenth is celebrated because it symbolizes the end of slavery, Juneteenth has become, become to symbolize for many African Americans what the 4th of July symbolizes for all Americans, 
freedom. It serves as a historical milestone reminding America of the triumph of the human spirit over the cruelty of slavery, honoring those who survived the inhumane institution of bondage, as well as demonstrating pride in the legacy of resistance and perseverance. And whereas Juneteenth is now celebrated annually across the United States on the weekend nearest June 19th and is the oldest celebration of the end of slavery in the United States. Now, therefore, I, Melanie Barr Monson, by the virtue of the authority vested in me as mayor of the city of Zephyr Hills, Florida, do hereby proclaim June 19th, 2024 as Juneteenth Community Celebration Day in the city of Zephyr Hills, Florida and urge all citizens to become more aware of the significance <coughs> of this celebration in African-American history and in the heritage of our nation and city. In witness whereof, I hereunto set my hand and cause the seal of the city of, the, of Zephyr Hills to be affixed this 10th day of June, 2024. Thank you. <laughs> And Kim's going to talk about the Let's celebrations go. that are coming up, yeah. right? Yes, yes that yeah, what you like? Okay, yeah, so we're Parks, Recreation, Natural Resources. We're just so honored, and just thank you guys for recognizing um, Juneteenth. Again, it does symbolize just a day in American history where slavery ended. So our celebrations look a lot like our board. This is just a small fraction of our board, but we are a diverse group, and we are just here just to champion recreation equity for all. So very briefly about our week of events. Go ahead, Dan. Can you come to the microphone, please? I love it. All right, we have Beats and Brushes. It's downtown Zephyr Hills at the Dog Pound. It's June 17th at 6.30, and it's $10. It includes all your supplies. It's a instructed base um, painting class. So painting with a twist, but... Without the, without the twist. Without the, but it'll be fun. <laughs> and then we have a Family Freedom Bowling Night at Zephyr Hills Pin Chasers, June 19th. It's from 6 to 8 p.m. It's $10 unlimited bowling and includes your shoes. So. Yep, what was our, your, what, what was her name? Deanna Baltimore. Okay. Yeah, um, we, we also uh, teamed up with Sarah Vandenberg. So on the 15th, we're going to have an introduction to pickleball uh, course out at Rusty Chapel. It's free, the event's already filled, but we have 40 people and another 40 people on the waiting list, so super excited. Um, outside of that bowling event, which is big for the city of Zephyr Hills, we have um, our biggest event, which is on the 22nd of June. We left some flyers out front, but that's our East Pasco community celebration. We have a Juneteenth pageant for kids. We award local um, students uh, scholarships, just a day of music, fun, food, and just community, so thank you guys again. So they are still looking for sponsors for the bowling on Wednesday night, right, Kim? Yeah. Bowling on Wednesday night, still looking for sponsorships? No, we've been really blessed, though. Are you okay? You're okay? Well, good. Okay. We do have tickets, so They do have tickets. Okay. I would just like to thank you for We started celebrating in 2004. And it was really sporadic and hit and miss, and, and you've put us on a regular schedule so we don't forget. So I appreciate that and, and look forward to your events. Thank you. Hey, Mayor, I'm, this is still under you. I don't know if you're introducing this or. Um, Todd, going to go forward, yeah. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor, Council, Todd Vandenberg, Planning Director. I'll do a brief introduction about this next item for the mobility plan presentation. I think council's aware we've been taking a very proactive, proactive stance on 
traffic, transportation. You know, we've uh, uh, approved a hotspots map. We've been up upgrading, updating our, our traffic study requirements. Uh, strong emphasis on left turn lanes. And the other thing we did proactively was apply for a state of Florida grant, which we got uh, some funding to help us with this mobility grant. So we, tonight we have Tammy Verano of Verano Consulting with us tonight, uh, and Rob Kersey with, with Benish, and, and you see some other folks in the um, audience that were participants. We had a number of public workshops. Some of y'all were able to attend some of those. So we're on a really fast pace. We gotta get this thing wrapped up and tied up and sent to the state this week, along with all the invoicing and everything. So uh, again, we've had a lot of public input. And what we'd like to do now is have Mr. Kersey come up and present a PowerPoint, kind of summarizing the mobility plan, strategies, and recommendations for you tonight. Thanks, Todd. I appreciate the introduction. I am Rob Kersey with Benish. It's been my pleasure to work with Tammy and Todd and all of the uh, Zephyr Hill staff in working on this project. We got off to a quick start late January, early February. As Todd mentioned, we had a couple of public workshops. Uh, we also um, had an open house last week for two hours before we presented our findings to the Planning Commission. So we've had a good opportunity to get some public comment and some comment from the Planning Commission, and it's been, been very worthwhile. I did want to comment, though, on one thing about the Juneteenth events is I would really like that night of bowling. I find bowling very relaxing and something that's very pleasurable. I thought pickleball was going to be the same thing. <laughs> I really thought I would get out there and enjoy it. I would get to move a little bit and stretch and get rid of some stress. And I did for about the first two or three times. And then I realized that people take it very seriously. And it got very competitive very quickly. And I realized that I was out of my league before I even got started. So uh, I might take you up on the bowling. That sounds like a lot of fun. So let's start with what is a mobility plan and kind of what it's not. Um, mobility is the ability or capacity to move, speaking of pickleball, and uh, quality or state of being mobile or movable. So there's a lot of transportation planning overtones in the mobility plan, and we're really planning for facilities, projects, and programs which will allow the citizens of Zephyr Hills to move freely uh, throughout Zephyr Hills and the surrounding area. Um, but it also takes into context what the community is and what the needs of the community are. Because it's not just building infrastructure for the sake of building infrastructure, as you'll see later, it's about connecting places and making sure that people have the freedom of choice for their mobility options, as well as um, their, to meet their travel desires as they move place to place. You see we got a great logo here, Going Places, Perfect logo for a mobility plan. Thank you, Tammy. Um, here's what I'm going to go through today. I'm going to do a plan overview. I'm going to talk about the strategies we came up with, some of the concepts, and then close with some recommendations and the next steps. Part of the overview, this plan is not a plan that's going to be adopted by the city. So there is no set list of projects that's getting approved. There's no funding being allocated. There are really no priorities being set. What it is is it's setting a vision for mobility needs across a lot of different project types and a lot of different service areas to make sure that everybody has mobility options. Uh, what that does is it creates a vision for the city, which the planning department can then move forward with, and it sets the groundwork for your comprehensive plan and other programs that are being developed. It also provides us some guidance as to, you know, maybe some smaller projects that the city can get behind and fund and make a big impact very quickly on uh, improving mobility within your community. So the Going Places Mobility Plan, pivotal role in the update of the city's comp plan, as I stated, ensuring that transportation landscape is aligned with the community's broader vision for growth, development, and placemaking. Study objectives were to enhance accessibility, make sure that the connections can be made and that people have safe, reliable, affordable transportation options, reduce environmental impact and support a healthier city. I think we've seen with all cities, especially smaller cities such as yourself, have really gotten behind this idea of being a healthy city 
and providing active transportation options where people can get out uh, and play and walk and bike and, and have good re recreation options. So that ties in as well as, of course, environmental stewardship, which is always important for small communities. Also supporting the local economy, you'll see here that we've really talked about economic development and, and how transportation can serve your growing industrial uses and some of the new developments that you have uh, that will be uh, exciting new developments with developments that will be coming into your community. And strengthen the fabric of the community by making it easier for people to connect with places, services, and each other. So transitioning to the strategies we came up with, kind of build upon that. Strategy one was to en enhance that safe, reliable, convenient, affordable options. And for that, we talked about improving mobility with job centers and key, key community destinations, making those linkages, enhancing accessibility and comfort at uh, transit stops. You've got some great transit stops around here as it is, but anything you can do to promote that and make it easier for your transit users, especially this time of year when it's getting hot, you're gonna start having regular thunderstorms. It's nice to have nice shelters for, um, for those who take advantage of transit. And collaborate with communities to develop solutions with established neighborhoods. <clears throat> Strategy two, talking more about the uh, uh, active transportation and the healthier community, constructing sidewalk, bike lanes, and trails in strategic locations, installing bike racks in convenient locations at community destinations, uh, and exploring opportunities to expand the use of low-speed, non-motorized vehicles. These are more easily um, funded, implemented projects, more of a shorter, shorter term. We'll talk about those a little bit later, but some of these are what we would call the low-hanging fruit that really you can get out there and start to, um, start to catch people's attention and say, hey, we really are getting some things done here around the community. Strategy three is upgrading the transportation system to provide reliable access to markets um, from the Zephyr Hills Industrial Corridor. Some of that is some larger scale uh, improvements to Chansey Road and the, and the airport area, as well as some intersection improvements that might be needed. Todd mentioned hot spots earlier. Hot spots are obviously something that, that would fall into this category. Developing complete streets improvements within the community re redevelopment area and partnering with county and regional agencies to develop the regional bypass loop road. Many of the projects that, that you see that we will identify that are widening projects or large capacity projects. Obviously the city cannot fund yourself, but you're gonna have to partner with the MPO, the county, the FDOT, and whoever the um, jurisdictional agency there is to make sure those projects happen. But identifying the needs for those projects, the need for those projects, and showing your support helps advance those projects and get them closer to the implementation stage. And finally, uh, strategy four, um, establish connectivity standards for new developments to create walking and cycling connections between residential and other destinations. You got a lot of new developments coming online, especially in the periphery, periphery areas of, of your city or on the fringe of your city. And you wanna make sure that as those developments come online, you have the opportunity to make those connections and immediately connect those citizens to the other, other services and destinations within your city. And engage with communities to identify priorities and preferences that reflect the unique character of each. And with that, I'm glad we only had four strategies so I wouldn't have to read anymore. So when we talk about mobility concepts in the in the, the term concept that we were using was really the concept of what your community is and how your community has developed over time and how it currently exists. And for that, we developed this somewhat cartoonish map here that creates really the uh, established areas, the rural reserve area, uh, village of Pasadena Hills area, your Gall Boulevard commercial corridor, as well as the reimagined Gall Gall Boulevard area, the Zephyr Hills Industrial Corridor I talked about, and obviously uh, a lot of commercial nodes and uh, growth areas in and around the city. So when we really got started here, these were kind of just rolling everything into these gross place types. This is what we came up with and said our 
goal really or our vision for this plan is to connect all these areas and make sure that people can get across town, people can get, you know, two miles down the road to the uh, to the convenience store or the um, grocery store if you need to. Basically, you can meet all of your mobility needs within Zephyr Hills as easily and freely as you as you can. We also knew that a lot of um, when we start these kind of plans, we don't want to ignore good work that's already been done or work that is in place. So the next slides really talk about a few concepts that are out there that we wanted to make sure that as new facilities come online, they're in keeping with and support a lot of these things. Uh, on the left there, you see the bypass loop road concept. It's something that um, um, I know the, the city's been, been considering and trying to formalize over time. So we included that and put it as a line on the map, something to aspire to. Gall Boulevard Vision Streets is something that's been worked on. We wanna make sure that we bring forward those elements and, and continue to build on those, on those items and those elements. We also talked about safety, because safety is foremost in everyone's mind right now, especially when we have conflicts between pedestrians and cyclists and, and autos or motor vehicles. Uh, we hear about them quite frequently and they usually don't end well. This was just an example here of a pedestrian crossing on State Road 54 east of Court Street. Uh, just, a, just a location where putting some type of a uh, flashing beacon in place, um, a crosswalk that's very visible uh, well, as long, along with signage uh, would help um, facilitate movement of pedestrians across the road. We picked this location because we did a crash analysis to see where clusters of crashes had occurred, and this was a location where there were quite a few. I believe there was a convenience store, a transit stop, uh, just a lot of people crossing the road here, and if we can do anything to protect them, it certainly helps. And this is another example of, um, of something that, that's relatively low cost as far as the impact that it could have in providing safety, refuge, and save lives. This is something from the Florida Department of Transportation District 7 Strategic Freight Plan. They develop freight design guidelines. Might be a little bit out of scale here for, the, for this image as far as what's actually envisioned for, for Chansey Road. But it does let, let you understand that uh, the 18 wheelers and the large trucks can navigate the environment and um, have ways to navigate intersections very easily not destroy or crush curbs. It's getting the correct turn radii in place. You see in this example, it's actually in more of a uh, industrial park setting where you have, um, have sidewalks and, and crosswalks. So it does, does promote some type of mixed use. Um, but really what I think probably need to focus on within, uh, within your industrial areas is, is making sure that at the intersections, you're getting those turn, turn radii in place and allowing those trucks to get through. Uh, as I was coming here today, I believe I was on, uh, I think I was on Island Boulevard and a truck had stopped to make a turn to get into Publix and um, had the right, right lane completely blocked. So we're all trying to dive to the left and not get hit by the car that's in our blind spot. And uh, it just shows you that once again, even getting into those commercial developments, uh, the trucks have a tough time getting in there. And you think, okay, that's not that, that huge of a deal but you got the safety aspect, and if there actually is a crash and it blocks traffic, uh, think of the uh, multiplier effect and compounding effect of, of that truck blocking that traffic for a long period of time, so it really does start to affect the, the level of service of your roadways. So let's get down to the recommendations. For the needs, we cast a rather broad net and considered all types of options, but essentially, uh, we wanted to advance safety and complete streets concepts. Some of that, think about maybe the Gall Boulevard area or some of your downtown areas where you can start to uh, implement some of those uh, uh, multimodal components. Adding a regional trail network for connectivity, addressing gaps in the bicycle and pedestrian networks. I bring those up because they are, they are on the map. They're a little bit more muted and not quite as prominent. Everybody thinks, okay, it's all about roads and widening because you see that there with the, with the red lines and the, um, 
and, and some of the, and, and the blue lines for, for the freight corridor. But we also do have those multimodal elements in there and some of those active transportation elements in there. Most of them connecting the downtown with the surrounding areas and definitely don't overlook those. Uh, we wanted to relieve congestion and, and, um, and create road, road capacity. One of the big eye openers we had was last week whenever we were at the open house and we pulled up the MPO's needs plan. And maybe not so much as in years past where more projects were identified in the western part or central part of the, of the county. Your part of the county is highly identified as needing capacity improvements. From the Vision Road networks, you've got a lot of, a lot of roads going to two to four lanes. As we know, that doesn't happen overnight. That could be 20 to 25 years in the future. But one of our takeaways from that open house and our meeting with the Planning Commission is that the timing is right for you to get behind some of those projects. And not only are you putting them on your map to support them, but the MPO and the county are have them on their maps and they're supporting it, which means, you know, as we know, working with your partner agencies is the way to get things done, especially because they're the ones that, that uh, control the larger dollars for those larger types of projects. So it all came together in this map. We have the, uh, um, some of the symbols there for freight intersections. We have the symbols for safety improvements, which highly comes from the um, hotspots work that Todd referred to earlier. You can see the bike trail uh, loops that are also in there. So we feel like it's very comprehensive and has a little bit of something for everyone. Uh, when and how that ends up being your ultimate map for Zephyr Hills, it may be well in the future, but you take the bites of the apple one at a time and you, before long you start to, start to make a real difference. So let's talk about next steps. For those of you who have been in the previous meetings, ah, this is a new one. We, you haven't seen this graphic. This is one that we just, just completed today. We wanted to give you an idea of relative costs. This really came up with the Planning Commission. You know, how long can, can it take for some of these projects to come online and how much can they cost? All relative here, um, we didn't actually cost out any specific project. That was not part of, the, part of the scope of work. But we really took a look at the things that could make a difference in the short term. Things you could go out and put in, your, uh, put in a, a work program now, uh, coordinate with uh, um, some of your partner agencies. Everything from you know, from bus stop amenities to lighting. We heard a lot about safety at crossings, for trail crossings as well as pedestrian crossings and how lighting could make a big difference. There's that safety component. Uh, bike pad improvements, traffic signals, intersection safety. Those are all things that I would say stay in the, in the, in the low to medium range as far as, you know, up to five million. <laughs> it's hard for me to say that and say that that's the medium range, but $5 million is a lot of money, but you know, it just takes that much these day to, days to do things. And that all stays within the medium term. And then you get to the longer, longer enhancements, which are really significant transit service enhancements. Uh, some of the local road extensions that, uh, that, that we're talking about and in, in completing some of, some of your network, really where we're building new roads. And then the major capacity improvements, that's gonna be the widenings. Kind of compartmentalized them here as far as a short term would be what would be in your in your current year's work program. Uh, one to five years would be something that you'd see in the in the in the MPO's traffic improvement program, transportation improvement program, or FDOT's five year work program, and then anything beyond that gets into the long range transportation for the five to twenty to twenty five year uh, time frame. But that just gives you some idea of of, of some of the next steps that, that you can take to promote some of these projects that, that we've identified and give you some idea of, of what, we, what you're looking at as far as implementation timeline and cost. So where are we? We were real quick to get to this point because uh, the grant that, that we received from the Department of Commerce uh, had to have us finished by June the 30th. And if you look at the calendar, we're close to that. So uh, we have the draft documents ready to go. Uh, we have uh, all of the um, all of the documentation ready that checks the box and shows that we did everything that we were supposed to do ourselves as the consultants and the city in meeting the guidelines for this uh, for this grant. So 
we're going to move very quickly and get that packaged up. And although the major study effort will be over, I hope you see that this document is a living document that can be used and drawn upon for many years by the city uh, to guide your uh, mobility vision for Zephyr Hills. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you um, uh, for the presentation. And I, I, I do have a question on um, some of these ridership programs. I know this is kind of new things like freebie. Have you heard of that before? Mm -hmm. it, it, is that a, does that help enhance the mobility plans in any way, or is it still too early to get data on that? Or It does, and uh, you'll hear more about, uh, you know, um, on-demand transit, some of those other components that mm -hmm. I'm sure I know Go Pasco is, is exploring. But a lot of things like Freebie and the other shuttles, you see them operating in Tampa and some other areas. Uh, yes, they do help. They actually provide a, a nice, they're, they're a good community enhancement. Many times they're done as a pilot project or some type of a, of a grant program that provides the, the money for that because many times they are free rides that are provided but it really just, just does give your town a, or your city more of a, uh, um, of, of a community feel and kind of a, a, a neat new way to, to zip around. It could become a, a permanent program and it could be something where the city could partner and provide um, funding for that. But yes, those are definitely part of the programs. I didn't highlight it too much here, but beyond your normal fixed route transit system that, that you have right now, those are additional ways to provide community mobility. And I think they should should be explored. We have them in the documentation. Tammy was putting a lot of interesting stuff in there about that. Tammy Braun of Rana Consulting. So um, I sit on the four Pinellas, or I did sit on the four Pinellas Citizens Advisory Committee. We had a presentation by the freebie folks. Uh, the city of St. Pete Beach was adopting this, and I think that the city of Dunedin, actually the city of Dunedin is doing it because I have a picture of them. But uh, the way I understand it is that you can set it up in many different ways. So you could have all your trips that either start or end in your downtown. They're actually using it in food deserts. So getting people who don't have access to grocery stores so that you can kind of cordon it off and then the services within that area. Um, also, I understand from that presentation, which was in the last year, that DOT is funding that 50% for a period of two years, unless that's changed, but that seems like a, a nice incentive. And it is based on a, um, like a rental car sort of, so you, you get so many cars, depending on what your need is, and you just pay an hourly cost for those cars, and there's always a ADA vehicle um, in conjunction with that, and it's entirely free, so there's, not quite certain about the the uh, funding plan, or, but it, it is something that sh I think would be uh, interesting to look into. And, and, and thank you for bringing up those, uh, like the DOT um, funding source too. So, thank you. Does anybody have any? Okay. Um, I noticed that. Are there any plans to include in this mass transit with the county bus system? I was thinking that <clears throat> um, we we need to expand it to the eastern part of the community the airport and industrial areas on Chansey Road. Um, so is that something that could be incorporated in this or is that different from what this is? It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be different. We didn't explore a lot and, and um, take a look at current routes and where they should be extended within the city, leaving that more to the purview of, of Go Pasco, who I believe is currently updating their transit development plan um, and will be looking at that. Um, but yes, that should be looked at and uh, the city should, should promote and be part of the development of any service expansion. We just kind of left it under the umbrella of transit service expansion. Um, but as far as knowing exactly, we didn't go into an analysis to determine where that, um, that demand would, would be greatest and where those new service areas could be. Uh, but my firm does provide that service if you want to. Okay, hey, thank you very much. Um, um, so these recommendations um, that you're coming up with, those will be in apps and those types of things will be incorporated. Comprehensive plan. 
Yeah, some of the additional next steps Say is your name. Uh, oh, Todd Vandenberg, Director of Planning, City of Zephyr Hills. Sorry. Um, yeah, uh, another positive attribute of this mobility plan is we, well, of course, we're updating the city's comprehensive plan. Uh, housing elements, big part of the comp plan update, as well as transportation. So a lot of the policies uh, that, that are identified in, in the mobility plan will be able to be pushed right into the transportation element of the comp plan. And then from there, then, yeah, we'll, we'll figure out uh, any additional further implementation strategies that have come from this mobility plan uh, that could be incorporated into the city's land development code. Uh, like the new traffic study standards that we recently adopted, that was implemented already. But yeah, we'll, we'll look at opportunities to do that as well. But getting the proper policies in the framework would be the first step of the comp plan update. Because we don't want to leave this like kind of put on a shelf. So these ideas and these recommendations need to be put somewhere where we can implement them as well as. Yeah, and another thing we, uh, Tammy was working on it, uh, very last minute we thought about having a, a handout, whether it's uh, on a card or a executive summary of the city's mobility plan that we can share with people, or when we go to a meeting, just kind of a snapshot of the mobility plan just to share with folks. and. So that's something else we're going to try to create. We'll, we'll have some additional activities. Well, what I'm getting at, I guess, is once this is sent to Tallahassee and it's put in the comp plan, how do we get these routes and, and these ideas and these safety issues yeah, worked on and, and implemented? Think, you know, we're, we're, of course, preparing, all the departments are preparing our budgets for this uh, upcoming year. We've got to have that done the end of this week and some of these items could be brought into the budget whether it's uh, you know we're, we're trying to be very proactive with the bus stops we got some great exhibits um, that Tommy Lee has put together for uh, an example that we could use so we could start looking at those you know maybe maybe one of those crosswalks where we've had the accidents that's a, some low-hanging fruit that we could probably start looking at and uh, and then, you know, we've been very proactive, Mayor and I, Lance, uh, you know, getting projects on the needs plan that's being updated right now. So, of course, a lot of those bigger projects, as Rob had addressed, you know, that, that's, again, political and continue to try to push. Uh, one idea Rob had that we talked about at the Planning Commission meeting was, yeah, maybe prioritizing what is, you know, we, of course, we know about 301, but... After that, what, what is the next push that we need to really, you know, is, is it the bypass loop? You know, is it Island Boulevard? We've heard a lot about that. Of course, we're working on Geiger Road. But, yeah, so I, I think some of those items that you've heard about tonight can be talked about at the budget meetings. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, and, and thank you for the presentation. Uh, and in my mind, we're, we, we're going to use this as a, as a guideline to come up with a priority list of, of items. So in my mind, immediately what we need to do is come up with that list of priority items because you're right, it takes 20 years to get uh, two more lanes on 54, you know, and it takes, it'll take another 10 years to get overpass road to push through. So, but we need to have it all, we need to all be pushing for the same projects, the same large projects, and the smaller stuff that we can identify that we can uh, knock off with, with the help of DOT or Pasco County or the state or the feds, we need to, that's what, that's what I think we need to do. We need to have a list of, pro, of specific projects that we're gonna, pri and then prioritize them. Sorry. All right, well, um, thank you very much, Rob. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you, Todd. You're welcome. My appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Appreciate that. And and the uh, planning commission really was happy with how this came together too. And really, it's getting everybody in line is what it is. So if if MPO knows this is what we want, and if the county knows, then we start working together. So I I like that idea. And to Lance's um, statement is DOT is really focusing on safety and the county right now. So if we can use some of their funding to get some safety on our roads, then we need to just 
plow forward and get that done ASAP while, before they pull money away from us. So appreciate you guys doing this work, and, and I think it will pay off in the long run. Mayor, you're right, if I could, Mr. President. Um, you're right, because we could actually come up with some crosswalk locations on 301 and go ahead and start approaching them, and even that's going to take two or three years to get done. I mean, it's crazy how long it takes to get done. Right. But, I, but I think we do need to identify those and jump on them quickly. I agree. They're all about lighting right now and speed, you know, type of things. And, you know, we've been in contact with a lot of them, trying to keep trying to figure out where, what directions. So thank you. It's everybody working together for sure. So the last thing I have um, is the city manager evaluation. As you guys know, this is done once a year. It's, it's supposed to be done once a year on an annual basis per uh, city manager's contract. It's to be done in June of each year, and then we'll present it in July. So we have written. Sandra has helped work put this together with me since I've never done this before. So thank you, Sandra, for working with me. She does have hard copies of this that I to hand out to you guys um, if you'd like them that way. Or if we need to, we can do a link. If But there's five of you. So, uh, <laughs> but as soon as you can get them done and get them back to me, uh, seal them, put them in my my basket, that would be great, and then we will, uh, I'll work up a, a summary, and we'll, we'll meet with Billy, and, and. Do you have a deadline? Yeah, the deadline is June 27th, so you have a couple of weeks to put this together, okay? Aaron, so. I, I know the, the original request was to um, provide the evaluation on July 8th. But I am out of town for that meeting, right. so I changed it in the memo yep. for the second meeting. Just yep, I saw that. Okay. So he's that's why we're going to do it at the end of July. So, okay, so it should get. Uh, uh, do you have a preference, uh, written or? I don't have a preference uh, either way. It's it doesn't matter to me. So we can pass those down if you want to take one, and then I'll get one I'll to to Charlie. Yeah. I'll get one to Charlie when he gets back, okay? And I appreciate your help with this, and thank you. Hey, thank you, Mayor. Um, at this time, we have seven consent agenda items. They can be voted on in, in their entirety, or if any council member wishes to pull one for further discussion. So I'll lead up the council at this time. President, I move approval of the consent agenda items. I'll second. A motion a second to approve all seven consent agenda items signify uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The motion passes. Can I just get a clarification on something that was in here? Um, in the uh, information for the Jones Edmond contract, it said. Sorry. Yeah. Uh -huh. okay. I, I just can't. Read when you were talking. It'll look that way, but this thing is cemented into the board here, so I can't. <clears throat> I'll, have to, I'll have to go back and check. I, I, I believe 2017 is when we went out to bid, so there could have been a contract prior to with Jones Edmonds, okay. but I believe 2017 is when we went out to, the last time we went out to bid for this agreement. All right, because they, all right, so this is the second round of bidding or something. Right. All right, all right, thank you. Okay. Yeah, we are. Good. All right, we're on to the business items. This one is a public hearing, and I will turn it over to city attorney at this time. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. President. Business item 3.1 is the second reading of ordinance number 14. 79-24 ordinance of the city council of the city of Zephyros, Florida, establishing a new 12 month moratorium on the consideration of new residential applications for annexation, land use modifications, rezoning, major plan unit development amendments, conditional uses or variances for property over one acre, providing for conflicts 
exemptions, severability, expiration, and an effective date. As you already stated, this is a public hearing. Okay, uh, at this time, I'm gonna open a public hearing. Ms. Hill, no, sir. Nobody speak, oh, signed up to speak. Does anybody wish to speak on this item? All right, I'm going to close the public hearing and I will turn over to council for discussion. President, I move that we approve the extension of the residential moratorium for 12 months, um, ordinance number 1479-24. I'll second. I have a motion to second to approve. Uh, Mr. President, just yeah. some discussion okay. Okay, on Okay, go that. ahead. I, and, I'm, um, and I just wanted to, to point out that it's for new construction. We un all understand that there's a, so were some projects on the pipeline that are going to go through. So I've had some people ask me about that, and I'm, I just want everybody to remember that it, it's anything new coming in that wasn't prior in, prior in the pipeline as of a certain date. So I just, just wanted to. And, and we have, have had a lot of conversations about this and what constitutes new and all. So, and it uh, does not um, apply to commercial at all. Just to make or that clear, residential. or or yeah, or individual residences building homes and stuff. That's it's just new way. development. In the the list of projects that were in the pipeline prior to the first moratorium is included in this as well. That continues. Okay. Do we have a motion? Do we have a second? We, do. we have a motion and a second to approve uh, business item three point one. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion passed unanimously. Thank you. Now to the planning director's report. I believe we'll have Todd back up. Todd Vandenberg, planning director for the city. While Lori's pulling up the, the PowerPoint that we have tonight, I'll, I'll go ahead and introduce this item and do a presentation myself with the PowerPoint. And then we have several representatives from Advent Health that are here tonight also to add any input or answer any questions that you might have. We only had one item on the agenda tonight uh, from the this past planning commission meeting that we had. Uh, so it's a plan and report on two land use actions uh, submitted by Advent Health. If we want to go ahead and, can I run this? Okay. Okay. This property is located in the city limits of Zephyr Hills. As you can see on the location map, the location of it being uh, situated at the southwest corner of a pretty pond and wire road. Um, we, we also have a, a mix of uh, future land uses on this property, uh, including MU, which stands for mixed use and public semi-public. So those are the existing future land uses, and they're proposing a, a change to RU, which stands for residential urban, which would support multifamily residential. The zoning is a mix of PUD, Plan Unit Development, and OP. OP stands for Office Professional. And they're requesting a change for all the land to be uh, zoned PUD, Plan Unit Development. What we got here? We'll come to that in just a minute. Uh, the property is undeveloped. It does have a significant amount of tree canopy. And there is a rising grade from Wire Road to the, to the west of the property. As you can see on the, the screen right now, the uh, part of the preliminary plan that goes is, is always attached with the uh, PUD zoning is what you have a, in front of you there. And it's a proposed project of 252 apartments. There's a mix of two and three story uh, apartments with the, what, what the staff asked for on the left side or the area closest to Dairy Road and west of the amenity center, we asked for those to be two story. Then you have the amenity center, and then you have additional units that go all the way down to, to Wire Road, which would be three-story. So the, the applicants agreed with that kind of terracing the height of, of the units for the apartments. <clears throat> so 252 units the, and, and the plan that you see here uh, would be the maximum number that they'd be allowed to build. And, of course, the plan hasn't been final design engineered, so... Uh, depending on the base and special concern, and final engineering for the retention plan could could change slightly. So in the future, if this is approved, if you decide to move forward to the ordinance preparation by the attorney, there'll be a future final PUD master plan that would come back 
and that be for our review. And of course, if a builder comes on board, that that be prepared and submitted by them for a review and, and final approval by the, the staff and, and city council. And, and that final development plan would include like architectural standards that we usually look at for multifamily, the, the landscaping, the buffering. Um, there are two access points, as you can see on this road, on, on this diagram here, of course, being on uh, one on Pretty Pond Road and the other on Wire Road. There was a preliminary transportation impact analysis that's been done for the project, <clears throat> and it does call for a, a, a right turn lane eastbound on, on Pretty Pond Road into the development. Uh, what staff has also done, we've, we've asked and recommended left turn lanes be included both on Pretty Pond and Wire Road. And that, that's talked about in the conditions. Uh, that'll be talked about with uh, in the future once the final development plan comes through. And of course, right away use permits will be a, required from the city in Pasco County. And uh, we'll get into the conditions a little bit, but we have talked about that in the, in the conditions. We're also looking at a roundabout uh, is underway with uh, some final engineering that's being being done as we speak at the intersection of Pretty Pond Wire Road to help with uh, level of service issues at that intersection as well as safety. Um, so that that's something we'll we'll hope to finish pretty soon. And we'll have to talk about you know the budgeting and everything on that coming up. Um, this is an infill uh, development, and staff believe that the proposed future land use and zoning request uh, tonight is compatible with what's happening in this area. And we also believe that the proposed use and height of the proposed units are consistent, compatible with the existing and planned development trends that were seen in this area. Uh, as was mentioned by the city attorney earlier, please note that the, these land use actions aren't subject to the moratorium. They were in the queue. They had submitted their petition prior to the moratorium ordinance. Um, so staff is recommended that the owners can proceed with their entitlements. Um, I, I will mention that given the latest on the, the water use permit, uh, we'd like to add a condition in there uh, for the future ordinance that uh, that at the time of construction permit, we have to have some language we feel at the staff level that you know water has to be available. Um, you know, uh, we don't know how long it's gonna be till a builder comes forth and what that timing will be, but we're kind of in a position where we, we feel like we need to add some standard conditions to even projects that are in the pipeline. Mr. President, and, and just while you're talking about that, Todd, I had that as my one of my questions is because we, we we're uh, kind of up in the air at this point as to our water availability. And, you know, by entitling this, we're not guaranteeing anybody water, correct? That's correct. Correct, and uh, so yeah, myself, the city manager, the city attorney, utilities director, we, we talked about this, and the other thing, of course, we're pushing for is for utility services agreements to kind of tie down that capacity. So that, that's, as you've seen on a couple other projects, we'll continue to look at that uh, opportunity as well. But, but yeah, I, I think that's what we at the staff level and the city attorney recommended we shared that information with the applicant and uh, but we're we were okay with moving forward with the entitlements with that understanding so yeah I just wanted to make sure that they were under the same understanding and and, and knew that and that really there's no obligation while we're working towards getting water entitlements I just no. I, I, we need to be very cautious yeah, on what cautious. we're guaranteeing that's what but, we're feeling too. I'll have them come up here in just a few minutes after I finish. Right, can I, I, I yeah. add to that? Yes, sir. Uh, I noticed on the report on page 11, under the public services analysis, it does state that underwater that adequate supply and utility infrastructure is loaded in the general vicinity. So are, with that line, are we guaranteeing that it's there? I mean, I know the structure's there, the infrastructure's there, but that language committing us to something that may or may not be true at this time? No, uh, we're, tonight's just a planning report, so this is, this is uh, the planning department updating council on the project and getting any feedback. The next step would be the ordinance, which we will, will address the language, but I think that's dealing with the capacity of the actual lines that, 
they're in the vicinity and that this project wouldn't be impacted. But well, part of it is, but part of it yeah. says adequate supply. So I just, yeah, well, I think we, we we'll need adjust. to clarify that language. Yeah. We, I've had conversations with the applicant and their representatives, and they're aware of until you go to actually construct, there's no, you know, guarantee that there'll be capacity. It'll be addressed at that time. We'll have the applicants come up, and then, of course, if you decide to move forward with the recommendation of staff and planning commission, the ordinance will be the next step. And then you'll, you'll be able to see that condition, and we can continue to look at that, and we'll flush that out, the language on that. Um, just a, a few planning commission comments that, that came up at our recent meeting. They, they did like the idea of pedestrian bike access from the apartments to uh, Derry Road, uh, where we, of course, have the multi-purpose trail. They, they thought it would be a good idea, which staff agreed, and the applicant was in full support of that, and they've actually got a condition that talks about that. Um, <clears throat> the staff and the Planning Commission wants the future builder, of course, to be careful with the drainage and the grade changes that's talked about in the staff report. Obviously, you're dealing with grades, and, uh, you know, uh, we, we want to be sensitive to that before any land clearing that we have a pre-construction pre meeting and talk about the retention pond. I don't think I need to go in further detail on that, but we, we want to always be cautious with that, particularly in properties that are dealing with grade changes like, like this one does. Um, th there was comments about uh, from the Planning Commission about a, another entrance on the Dairy Road. Right now, that's not proposed. Uh, again, this isn't a final development plan. Uh, certainly, when the, the future builder, developer builder comes in, that's a discussion we can have and see if there's opportunity for that. But right now, it, it's shown as the two entrances on Wire and Pretty Pond Road. Um, with that, staff and planning commission recommended approval. I, I, I suggest right now have Mr. Tu come up. He can provide any additional information, um, and then we can go over the conditions. Um, well, did, was Mr. Tu going to add anything to this right now, or did, or do it? Was get some okay. questions, and then maybe he okay. We'll try to maybe something he can Mr. answer. Tu try to answer your questions. Um, you mentioned that the property is 17 acres and up to 252 units, so that's eight buildings on site. You also mentioned there's a number of trees on the site, that some of which would be protected. Um, it's hard for me to see on this plan where any trees would be protected, and I don't see any really open space in here at all, that, uh, like a little park or a neighborhood, anything. There is a little patch. At park on the um, east side where there's parking just north of the entrance onto Wire Road. So I don't know what's in that, if it's concrete or what. But it seems to me that there's, I don't understand, I don't know how you would save a tree in that layout. Um, then you talked about Pretty Pond and Wire Road access. Um, do you have a, you, do they have to get a permit from Pasco County for wire road access? Wire road, correct. Yeah, it's okay. county on maintain road. We had talked after a, a couple of weeks ago, I had gone to the MPO meeting, and we learned that wire road's not on the county needs program. That's already a overburdened road. Um, is that on the needs program? And in addition to the, other than the roundabout, are there any other improvements to that roadway planned? Not in that general location uh, for the short term. Uh, you know, we think the traffic flows are now we have Dairy Road punched through. Once we make that connection to Cossack to Otis Allen Wire Road, we think that's going to change probably the, the traffic patterns of the area. Uh, we've also talked about probably uh, with, with the multifamily development in this area, it's proposed uh, heading back west to 301. The idea of having a double left southbound turn lane. Uh, originally, the plans designed where we had room to do that, and that would help out as well. That'll go all the way to Wire Road then, the double lane? Uh, no, I'm, I'm talking about going west towards 301 to have a double left turn lane onto 301 southbound. Right, okay. All right. Pretty Pond already backs up to Dairy Road, and is so. What I'm asking is, are you checking, what are the levels of services for those two roads, and are they going to be adequately improved to 
handle 252 new units. And again, right now, that, that traffic that you're referring to eastbound on Pretty Pond Road, I think it was a 342-foot right, right turn lane into so that that traffic can get into the apartments and that's not holding things up. And then, again, we talk, I talked earlier in my report about uh, left turn lanes uh, being two-lane roads. Right, but you're also going to have traffic coming out of that apartment complex that will be going east. So there will be an additional burden on the other portion of it going towards Wire Road. Um, the other question I have is you said that, so there will be um, five buildings, three stories, and three buildings, two stories. Now, I'm confused about, do you have to have a conditional use to have a three-story building well, now? Well, a conditional use, we're doing this as a planned unit development. Uh, they already had PUD zoning. Uh, we can do the same thing. The, the PUD becomes the code. Uh, so the standards as shown on the, the plan here becomes the code. So we don't have to go through a separate conditional use process. So when we change the... Um height of buildings and put into the code that it would only be two stories two months ago. We've already got a workaround about that then with the PUD. Well, with the plan unit development, that, that's kind of been the case where legally and it's always been where we can essentially develop the code that pertains to that specific project. And I, I think that question came up when we were and having the discussions. This was right. zone PUD a long time ago. Right, I remember that. Right. What and I'm saying is we, we addressed the code to manage that height and growth. And the first project that comes up basically sidelines that. I'm part of the project, correct. And then how much of the, you're not going to tear the hill down, right? Well, again, this is a very preliminary plan, but hilltop preservation is in our code. So, yeah, our intent would, I don't know how, they, they wouldn't meet that intent of the code if they were to just flatten it all out. Um, Do you have a um, timetable on the construction of the roundabout? Um, we're, we're doing the final design and engineering right now. And At a city project, not a county project? Well, the project. Metro Development Group Engineering Hamilton Engineering is actually doing the final design and engineering. Um, but the city's paying for it? They're, they're paying for all that. Now, we're going to have to pay for the construction, so that, that'll that be something uh, that'll have to be budgeted. Right, so it's a county at. road, but we're doing the improvement to it? Correct. Okay. Well, we, we've shared the roundabout design and kind of let them know of our interest of trying to get some support, but... Right now, we're just trying to get through the final design engineering and come up with a cost estimate and then have those discussions with them. And your, your question about the tree preservation, they'll certainly be required to uh, do a tree survey. We talked about that. Uh, we'll look at all the opportunities. To your point, really, you've got some open space areas around the amenity center and, of course, around the whole perimeter. Um, pretty packed plan there it is with uh, the the parking and apartment buildings in general that's going to be the case um, yeah I, I think uh, we just have to get really creative and I think that when we get the final development plan we can look at some enhanced buffering try to protect and save as many of the trees as possible around that whole perimeter corridor and then enhanced screening and buffering with the landscape plan. And I, I just, okay, I just want to kind of follow up on some of what Steve was talking about. So uh, first of all, the, on the traffic, I think it's imperative that the dairy road access, there be an access there because for the same reasons that you were just bringing up of the traffic. So I, I think it's almost a, a given that we need to have as many access points as we can. And since it's three-sided there, I think it would be a good uh, place for that. Uh, and I, this preliminary plan is not what we kind of seen a couple years ago. There was something in the works at one point because uh, on a three stories, if I remember right, there was very limited, like maybe one or two three story buildings and then more were two stories. So it seemed like we're kind of moving on to the, what you were talking about there with the three stories. And, I, and my, my hope is that some of the projects that have come in recently have 
actually come in with less density than what we kind of expected. And I would like to see that potential here too. Um, although with the 250 units and the, the gross acreage that it has, I mean, it's gonna kind of fall in there pretty good anyways, but um, you know, I think, I think that's consideration because now we're talking about more three-story buildings and just two two-stories, which was different than what we heard before. So those are things that we just got to kind of look at as we go along in the PUD and from our, our previous uh, discussions too. But I really think the access point to Dairy Road is, is almost imperative. And we're just at about just, just over, I believe, 14 units per acre. Right, that's what I said. I looked at, I looked at it. It's kind of fallen in there. And, you know, like I said, some of our, our uh, most recent uh, developments have come in actually doing a, a little better on some of the, you know, when we had it at 20 and we reduced it back to 14 where it was. And they're either hitting that or below that. So that's good that, that that's what's been happening. So I think this project technically could be 20 under a PUD. Right. I highest. understand that. But, yeah. but I'm saying that some of the ones that have fallen under that, too, have come in reduced density. And I'm kind of hoping that this one will be the same way. Um, you're exactly right. So. And I, I think we have to remember, excuse me, that on the opposite corners of this is also planned um, multifamily uh, apartments. So we're looking at one project now, but there, that whole intersection is three of the four corners are going to be apartments. And one's if, uh, uh, what, that, what, sorry, two, two of the three. The, so you homes. have the this townhomes. this project is is apartments. The uh, north west corner is our apartments. You have Crestview single family detached, and then the south east corner are uh, fifty townhomes. or sixty townhomes. So, but I mean, still all four are. And are being developed, and that was part of the reason, well, it was the reason why uh, we worked with Metro in the county to try to develop that roundabout uh, there at that intersection to try to move traffic because what we, we see what it looks like now. Well, just to capitalize on that, I mean, I think that we should be asking these developers to help with the construction costs of this roundabout. I mean, you know, it impacts anything within, you know, anything within a half a mile radius really should be kind of a shared expense, in my opinion. I would like to see uh, this at 14 units per acre instead of 14.13. That would be, you could achieve that by just changing one building to two stories, preferably the one closest to um, Wire Road, in my opinion, <coughs> would be better because we really are, you know, we've got this 30 feet or so of retention pond and then you go straight up with a three-story building and um, you know visually that's pretty impactful and then lastly I would uh, like to echo uh, Councilman Spina's uh, point and that is that I would like to see those trees that we're going to save be identified um, and not just token one or two uh, and then replaced with inferior trees if we're going to you know destroy Grand Oaks and put back maple trees, that's not really equitable, but that's my only concern. Otherwise, in general, I don't have any objection to this. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, similar concerns, especially, uh, I know we talked about the roundabout. Is there a specific <laughs> contribution towards it that the project will will have in the, in the PUD? Um, order or not not, not yet and I <laughs> all right I'll introduce myself Joel to TEW is the last name I'm a development entitlement consultant for Advent Health um, and thank you for uh, spending time with us tonight I've met most of you on some individual one-on-one -on -one meetings we've added this as you recall a few months ago uh, with most if not all of you um, when the new consulting group took over for Advent Health um, I'll kind of work in reverse on the questions and, and we'll address everything that you, you've mentioned tonight. Um, first of all, uh, Mr. Smith, um, we had discussion with Mr. Poe and uh, Mr. Vandenberg. Uh, the staff's thought process was that they would get larger bang for the buck if the uh, hospital developer's contribution was to these additional turning lane movements. Uh, because you pretty much already have the roundabout underway. You did have contributions from others. Uh, and 
basically because it's a pre-existing condition, Advent Health technically isn't responsible for the pre-existing condition because they obviously are putting no trips on that from this site. So the thought was we would be better off using the developer offsite contributions for the turning movements. Uh, as long as the city can get the county to agree since Pretty Pond and Wire Road are going to be also subject to their approval, we told the Planning Commission that Advent Health will certainly have its developer agree to whatever right and left turn movements. You may end up with right and left turn lanes on both Pretty Pond and Wire Road. Um, so you're going to hear from our transportation consultant. Uh, I'm going to bring him up last, uh, Ali Atefi, uh, who is with Links and Associates, formerly the Pasco County MPO uh, uh, head. And uh, the short story on the transportation is that he did, uh, per your normal requirements, he established the transportation methodology required by your staff and your independent transportation consultant. He did the traffic study, all of that pre-existing condition, the pre-existing trips, our additional trips on every one of these roads has been analyzed and approved by your traffic consultant. And he can, he can answer any real details on that. But the, the safe answer is that has been studied, has been approved, and the transportation folks believe that we're better served spending that money on additional right and left turn lanes so that you don't have things backed up because once that roundabout is constructed, the free throw movements are going to move. The issue is only going to be stoppage from someone waiting to turn. So we think you'll get a lot more bang for the buck if you allow the hospital's developer to spend their money on the turning lanes since you already have the <coughs> roundabout in process. And I, I can't speak for Mr. Poe, but that, that was the thought communicated to us by the city manager. Correct. And based on the, the, the transportation study that, that we looked at, um, turning lanes were not required. Um, and so that was the compromise or the, the discussion that we had is, is add those additional turning lanes that were not required by the transportation study. And when we're talking about those specifically on, would it be a right-hand lane all the way to the traffic's? circle on, so it'd be eastbound on Pretty Pond? Well, Ali could address that uh, in detail, but basically the transportation analysis requires a right eastbound right turn lane on Pretty Pond at our project entrance. Uh, that's the only one it required, but what we've committed in the conditions is when they come in for final, final site plan approval and do the final site access, if the city and the county both say, we would also like to see a westbound left turn lane on Pretty Pond. We'll also do that. And on Wire Road, if you and the county say we also need a southbound right turn lane and or a northbound left turn lane, we'll also do those. So we basically have committed to up to four turning movements, um, subject to you getting Pasco County to kind of agree with you that this is what is needed. The thought also is, the hospital doesn't have a buyer yet. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Uh, but even if they got a buyer in this market in short order, by the time they have due diligence of closing and then they've got to engineer the site, they got to design and permit the buildings, there's no way there will be physical construction out here in less than two years. The world just doesn't move. And so the thought process was you'll have that roundabout constructed. You'll see how things are moving and you can make a better informed decision at that point as to all these turn lanes. So that, that was the thought process that we talked through with Mr. Poe and with the transportation consultants. Uh, but the hospital's committed to making sure that the traffic around the site works. I mean, they'll, obviously they're a good partner with you and they'll make sure that happens. Um, and if you need Ali to discuss the details, he can certainly come up after I address these other points and tell you the details of the trips and where they're coming from and where they're going, because he, he did that work and he's the expert. But, but segueing back to the other questions, uh, for example, the trees, um, we don't have, the whole purpose of this exercise is that, you guys will recall this, that they did have a buyer originally when the apartment market was a lot more active. Uh, they had a different site plan. Um, 
and, but they decided not to proceed when interest rates spiked and capital got too expensive. The hospital made the business decision that they would go ahead and retain our new group of consultants and go ahead and see the entitlements through for the simple reason that most of you in business and particularly those in real estate understand it's, it's harder to sell property that doesn't at least have base zoning entitlements. Your buyers always speculate on what they might or might not get approved. They try to beat you down on the price uh, and tell you how hard is it to get the entitlements and how much it's going to cost and it really affects us the yield. The hospital needs this revenue to make capital improvements here at Advent Zephyr Hill. So the thought process was if we spent this money to get the entitlements, we would improve the hospital position in terms of what it can get from this asset to pour back into the hospital capital improvements. Um, but then that put us in this position where we said, okay, we're only going to prove a concept plan for all the reasons you brought up tonight. We don't really know until that drainage engineer drains the site. That prior plan you saw did not have nearly large enough retention ponds. There was no way that they had sufficient ponds. These ponds are over twice the size of what was on that. And these may still not be large enough. We may still find out, and in all probability, these ponds are going to get larger. So what I'm saying is we're just trying to get a maximum development entitlement, but we, we added condition number eight to specifically address what you're concerned about. We understand that when we get an actual buyer that has an actual product and they do the actual site engineering, they've got to come back, they've got to address the tree survey, they've got to address the topo, they've got to address the drainage, they've got to address the park open space, and they're going to have to comply with every land development code and every regulatory requirement you have. They may not get this yield of 250 units, but what the hospital needs to be able to represent in a contract is subject to your engineering and your planning and your meeting all city requirements. If you can meet those requirements, then you can have up to 252 units. Uh, that's always an ideal target. All these apartment investors, they're very reluctant if they don't get at least 250 or close to it, will they live with 240? If it's a really good location, probably. So we don't want anyone to think that we're actually going to build exactly this. Our job was to, with the planners and the engineers was to demonstrate to you that there was a logical layout um, that you could yield if everything falls in place, you possibly could yield close to 252 units. Um, the reason we configured this, I'm going to be quite honest with you, from those individual one-on-one -on -one meetings that I sat through, um, a lot of this is what we heard from some of you individually. Um, the no access to Derry Road was actually um, an important point to one or more of you. So uh, all we need is direction there. Uh, the transportation planners, I think, agree that you probably have too short a connection at Derry Road. There are already some issues at Derry Road. And a lot of people think that with the roundabout going in and us putting turning link movements on Pretty Pond and Wire Road, our access points probably really need to be on Pretty Pond and Wire Road. And I think that's what you're going to find out at the end of the day, that putting those trips out directly on Derry would probably be a mistake. But if you decide you want one on Derry, then obviously one can be put. We did agree to add the pedestrian access connection to Derry Road, which is a very good idea to get people onto that trail with bikes or walking and moving. Um, but again, this isn't locked in stone. And when you get our site plan, if you really feel that you also want a connection to Derry Road and that that's going to help, then obviously that will be done. Um, so that's kind of where we're coming from. The other thing is the reason we have two-story buildings west of the amenity and three-story east, that also was in direct response to input that we had from more than one of you. So in all fairness, uh, we spent a lot of money drawing the concept plan that we thought was responsive to that input. Uh, maybe some thoughts have changed, but uh, given the topo, the reason that's a really smart idea, even though it wasn't ours originally, it was yours, <laughs> but the reason that's a really good idea is you have substantially higher topo on the west side. So if you put the two-story ones west of that amenity and clubhouse and the three stories down the hill, from the road perspective, those roof lines are going to be roughly the same. 
the three-story is going to be no taller than the two-story on the west end. And so it gives you a more uniform appearance and it actually dwarfs, it helps dwarf those three-story buildings. You also on that eastern side are going to have a huge setback from our road. Uh, because as I said, this is the smallest those ponds are going to be. In all likelihood, they're going to have to be larger. And, and we, may, we may lose an entire building. There may be an entire building here. That can't, I mean, that's a very distinct possibility. Uh, and if it happens, it happens, and they get whatever yield they get. So that's our thought process. Uh, you didn't mention it, but we also added a specific condition, which we had talked to with, with several of you, and that was that we fully understand that when they come in with the construction plans, they've got to have building facade, architectural plans, variety and textures and colors, and you retain control over all that. So just because you're, you're, you're considering a conceptual zoning at this point, you still are gonna retain control over what that product looks like because they have to come to you with their specific product. Um, and I think that's it, just the, the building height and location control the building facade architectural, the site access, all of those are still to be determined and still 100% under the city's control. So that's why we thought that this made sense to try to get the hospital where it needs to be, hopefully to liquidate this asset in the next 12 months or so, so that they can rebudget those capital improvements that they had planned before and had to take out of the uh, current budget. So we're happy to answer any more, and if you're not comfortable on the transportation based on the limited information I gave, we have Ali here. We're, we're more than happy to have him uh, speak to you in more detail, but, uh, but I'm, I'll try to answer anything I can if there are any other questions. Mr. Two, if you could just touch on that. We did discuss the water. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Thanks, Matt. I forgot that. Yes, um, and I'll have, I'll have Nick Burgess come up and confirm directly for the hospital, but I'll say that we had, the, we had that discussion this week. The hospital fully understands that your agreement to go ahead and consider zoning now does not guarantee water capacity at whatever point their developer actually gets ready to come in and ask, you know, to either have construction plan approval or building permit or water connections. Uh, and that's fairly understood, as you guys know, in the development community. You get your real commitment from a county or a municipality, from my experience, when you buy your, your water and sewer taps. At the point you pay the money and, and buy those taps, that's when they're telling you, we, we actually have the capacity to meet this commitment. So the community understands that. We're also very hopeful, though, of course, that because it'll be at least two years before our buyer got to that point that you'll figure this out and, uh, and that availability will be there hopefully within a couple years. Uh, but obviously, and if Nick, it probably makes sense since I'm just a representative. Uh, okay, the big guy, the big guy will make, will talk to you about that. Hi, Ryan Willis, CFO at the hospital. Uh, I am aware of the conversations that have happened related to the water issues, and uh, we fully support what the, the city's trying to do here. So, anybody have any other questions or comments? If I can just add on, uh, they were talking about the size of the pond. This project does fall within the basins of special concern, so there's extra scrutiny on the, the pond size um, and the retention of, of the water on the site. And I think uh, Mr. Two is right that in the time frame, hopefully that roundabout will probably already be there. I think the turning lanes, left and right, are a very great idea because that's, like you said, that's be the only place you're going to have any stoppages. So if we can have those, both those lanes, I think that'd be great. Um, anybody have anything else? I guess I have a question to Todd. Um, if if this was zoned M4. R4? R4, mm -hmm. sorry. Um, how would it be different? They'd be allowed to go up 20 units per acre, but that's been reduced to, to 14 units per acre, um, the action you folks recently took. So, um, I mean, I, I think it gives us a little bit more latitude uh, of working in some of the conditions we've talked about, primarily being those turn lanes. Uh, the TIA was done, uh, only a right eastbound right turn lane into the development was required. So uh, I think the PUD gives us some flexibility uh, in the turn lanes. 
I think it helps us with any additional design architectural standards you want to uh, incorporate into the final PD master plan. And I think it helps us, you know, if you want to go above a, a minimum tree caliper for your tree removal for tree replanting, I, I think we have those opportunities that we talked earlier that we can build into that final development plan. Is it, I, I don't understand how uh, the zoning would impact turn lanes. Well, I think, again, right now the traffic impact analysis doesn't require turn lanes except for uh, eastbound right turn lane in from Pretty Pond Road. Right, but how does that impact, how does the zoning from PUD yeah, to... That, the, I think the answer, and, and Matt can uh, better articulate this as your attorney, but when you have Euclidean zoning like R4, you really can't make other requirements uh, beyond the Euclidean land development code requirements. So if, you, if you're asking for an exaction beyond that, such as turn <coughs> lanes that the traffic study did not require, then the only way you can get that is a PUD because a PUD is actually a negotiated zoning between you and the applicant. So as long as the applicant will agree to those additional items, you can require that. If you just did an R4, you can't require that. So the PUD is almost always in the county or the municipalities uh, to your advantage. Um, so that's why, and, and plus all these, all these quote custom design things like two stories on the west and three stories on the east and park area and additional tree requirements, you can't really require any of that without the PUD category. You can, you can negotiate all these conditions. The architectural control, you definitely under state statute could not do that without a PUD. So it's a big advantage really to everyone to, it gives you a custom design. It's what it gives you the opportunity is for a custom design. So that's why the PUD concept. Mr. And you, two. Mr. Two. Uh, uh, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. When would you expect to have a, a site plan to us? A after they find a buyer. No, the hospital is obviously not in the apartment business, so it's not going to design or presume to design until they have a contract buyer. That contract will be undoubtedly conditioned on them coming into you with their actual site plan, their building elevations, their, their renderings for them to get that next step. So the market is going to be determinative on the market. We think things are getting better, knock on wood. If interest rates at least don't go back up, stay where they are or drop a little, I think there'll be some activity. People love Zephyr Hills. Zephyr Hills is a hot thing now, as you know. I think this is a good market. And with the hospital as an employer, that also needs apartments for its own employees, as well as all the other employers you're trying to bring in that industrial area. I think this site will go fairly quickly when the market will allow it to go. Right now, the capital market for apartments is very flat. But at least it's not, it's not tanking. And Mr. Two, what I was going to ask you was the likelihood of this being the site plan is about zero, correct? Yeah, we'll say 1%. Right, right. So they're going to come in with their product, exactly. place it on the site. But the important thing is, is, and this was a good question the Planning Commission asked me, the important thing is we put these things that you told us were important to you, like where two-story, where three-story, where access is, we put those in the conditions so that we can tell our buyer this is the deal, like it or not. If you want to contract to buy this property, here are the conditions in front of you, and here's a conceptual layout, but what, if you change the layout, you've got to do it in a way that you still can satisfy the city that you're meeting these conditions. And by the way, bring your architectural plans and bring your tree survey and all these other things because you've got to get their approval on those also. But it gives us something more definitive for the hospital to put out there in the marketplace rather than someone thinking they're just going to come in here and build whatever they want because clearly they can't. And so that's, that's the point behind the business thought. If we approve the zoning, which I guess is what tonight is, or, or is this just, just a, a planner plan report? report. Planning planning report. So what we'll do is we would bring, no. yeah, we would bring an ordinance before you, but it would have the conditions that that we discussed in it. And, and Mr. Two is exactly right. If it was just uh, Euclidean zoning, we we approve it, and whenever it's built, whatever the traffic study at the time says is you know required, which is what our code says, then that's what they'll have to construct. There won't be any more or less than that. Um, 
I would be suspect of a traffic study that didn't recommend turn lanes. I, I don't understand that. In, in that whole, if they take into consideration that whole area and the planned uses in that area and existing uses. Um, Ali, you want to talk about that some more? And what was included in the study and what wasn't? <coughs> Good evening, my name is Ali Atefi with Lingsa Associates in Tampa, Florida. Um, yes, so, so the turn lanes um, are based on w obviously what's going into your development and also is the function of what's out on the, as a background traffic is on the road. So the way we uh, get that background traffic is to uh, collect counts, uh, then we uh, convert the counts depending on when we collected the counts, we convert them to peak season. That's when all the p folks come in um, from up north or other places. And then we, we uh, grow those uh, numbers to allow for the other developments that are going to be um, um, approved or planned. Um, and then you do the analysis. Um, so we uh, use uh, standard um, um, graphics and uh, curves to, to uh, ha having those numbers to see if the, the, uh, the warrants are met. Um, so in this case, uh, a lot of traffic uh, was coming from US 301 and in the evening, uh, when co people coming home, making an eastbound right turn, and that's why you see the warrants were met. Uh, on the other hand, the other directions, uh, because it was lower volume, um, the, those numbers did not meet the warrants. And the, we have your consultant reviewed our study, all the numbers were reviewed and we just followed your methodology and that's how we came up with. I think that's important to say is that Todd and I looked at it, the planning department looked at it, but we had Kimberly Horn, who's our traffic engineer, the consulting firm, review the study and it wasn't just two lay person reviewing that study and agreeing with it. Yeah. Ali, can I ask you a question? Um, the, the, the turn in off of uh, off of wire road was was there sufficient room from the channelized portion of the traffic circle to to have the left hand turn into there we did not look at that okay. and um, when when the site plan comes in as part of That'll that approval process you're going to get into all those detail um, look of the design and if you have room I, it looked like there was but it, I, I'm not yeah. sure. Joel, Joel too, again, that, that's a good point, though, because this came up at Planning Commission. Um, that access point on Wire Road you're talking about, that's also not locked in stone. So, for example, at the point of the site plan approval, the city and the county are going to determine, and again, after that roundabout's functioning, really how far south do you need that access point? And that's the beauty of this is obviously the ponds can change in size between each other because we can put that access wherever you need it. And this other point the Planning Commission brought up, which was an excellent one, is you have the proposed project on the north side of Pretty Pond. So the other thing we need to try to do is coordinate with them. You really need to try to require them to push their access point as far west on their property as they can so that we can then line ours up directly with theirs. And we have that flexibility. And again, that then needs to be a far, as far away west from that roundabout as possible. So all of that will be part of the site plan analysis. But we did uh, suggest to city staff that they kind of keep an eye on the one across the street and, and have our plan out when they're looking at that and make sure they get those, because you don't really want those offset if you can help it. 
That's smart. And it looks like there's room to do it. They, they don't go as far west as us, but if, if they go as far west as they can, Property. then we can hit a happy point that's pretty close to our clubhouse amenity, give or take 100 feet. I don't know why they hired me. They can have Joel do the... Uh, <laughs> 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 anybody have any other questions? No, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Those comments have been brought up and looked at with the Summit Apartments, and uh, so yeah, uh, ideally, of course, we want those two access points to line up. And conceptually, we do believe that uh, that there's sufficient room to avoid the uh, the tapering of those lanes from the roundabout uh, in and out. So we we think, but, but we'll continue looking at that, of course, with the final design and engineering of the roundabout. Okay, and I think uh, the hospital is committed to having their potential buyers to those turning lanes, provided the county will agree to it. So I think it's up to us to start now talking to the county about this and not waiting, even though this is just a conceptual plan. Well, we've already had preliminary discussions. Okay, so I'm saying, so I think we need to make yes. sure we're, we're ahead of the game Absolutely. on that because they're gonna commit them and their potential buyers to those turning lanes, I think will be extremely important. So we just need to make sure we stay on top of that. Yes, for sure. And, and, and when do you plan to start? What's the schedule for the roundabout? Well, again, all I can share is that we're, we, we did the preliminary design engineering. We had a meeting with uh, the county transportation folks, just so, you know, three of those legs are county owned and maintained just so they could see it make sure that they didn't have any objections. They said we're good to go. We can move forward with final design engineering. So they're working on that. I think we got an email recently that they plan to get us a, 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 a final revised rendering that showed the tapering of the lanes going in and out a little bit different. So I, I haven't seen that yet, but right. that should be coming in very shortly. And then again, it's a matter of uh, once the design engineer coming up the funding. And actually, Todd and I were looking at that. Uh, we were trying, I was trying to get an idea of what it was going to be like. And it, I think it's going to be very similar in size to the one up there on 98. Uh, and I can't remember the other road that Shelby comes in. Road. Shelby, Shelby Road. Road, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which and we had gone up there, what, a year ago probably, yeah. and looked at that and watched it function. And it functions very well, um, provided... It, it's an educational process, I think. So again, it's really that eastern movement from 301 that that's the the conflict. The other directions, not so much. Westbound from you know east of Wire Road really doesn't back up, and not too bad on north and south, going north and south too. But again, all those movements will work so much more efficiently with a roundabout. Yeah, and, so, and, and I'm and sure if we get turn lanes in again the. That PUD right. Get turn lanes. Right. I'm sure by the time we get the roundabout in, that we'll have the connection on Cossack Road help to wire. <laughs> We're working on that. We're working on that. I'm betting on the roundabout being in first. So I think y'all yeah, heard the presentation about the the number of units and what gets tied to this project are stipulated in the conditions. This is just the planning report. Uh, if you decide to move forward, uh, unless you have something that you want tweaked in the, the ordinances, Matt will draw up the ordinance with the conditions and we do a first reading at the upcoming council meeting is what the plan would be. One other question. Um, on the aerial of the property, there's a little leg kind of that goes down, a finger, I guess, that's part of the property. What's going to happen to that? Anything? Well, Go on. This isn't allowing me to go. Back. Get the, Could we go back to the aerial? Please. Page two. Or there page 100, back. depending on where you are. This one, Steve? No. no next one. Or, no. Well, the one in the packet's the second page. We'll go back to the aerial. Maybe it, you just might have to zoom in. Oh, maybe we didn't have the same in your packet that we did with the PowerPoint. we go back to the aerial? Could we go back? You may to have the to zoom in on the aerial. It doesn't show it there. Uh, uh, it's the a piece that runs behind the daycare, between the daycare and that, the It's between the, the nursing uh, home. Which one? Uh, uh, the existing right apartments and... Um, and the daycare center. I don't know what that is in the back. Isn't that... Oh, yeah, the, the nursing home and the daycare. Church. 
yeah. between the daycare service, center? The daycare, the living, assisted living facility. Right. That's not part of the zoning plan? Correct. Well, what's your question on here, Steve? Well, it's shown on it's here as the property boundary. I just wondered Odd, come here. what you're doing with it. It's not on that one. That's property that they own, but it's not part of this zoning. Okay. Uh, so this shouldn't have shown that. But how much yes, property that, is that it? Do you a, know? A change. It, okay, it's so it's just not included. It it'll just be out there. Right. That that north south parcel uh, is not part of the zoning because it's actually part of the access easement for the nursing home, and so. They're they're leaving it out of the apartment parcel oh, entirely, okay. depending on what happens to that small parcel uh, there on Derry Road. So it's the maps were not entirely correct originally before we got the actual boundary survey. So we may have one in the report that wasn't swapped out. But the the graphic on the screen here is the zoning parcel per the actual certified survey. So that's just hospital property that's going to remain there and correct okay and it's it's really kind of a no-man's land right now between the nursing home and the other facility that that you'll see that access driveway across the northern part of it right I see it all right thank you all right and that's just a report that we have for that so I'll move on to the city manager report so is there a consensus to move forward uh, I, well yeah I guess we I would move forward with the condition. And the other thing I want to say is I feel like we've got a good partner with the hospital. They've heard our concerns and they're going to be uh, they're, they're going to be stressing these to any potential buyer. And, and I think just to add on to that, and we understand the hospital's point. What I mean, what their position is too. So I mean, it, us working point. together with, like you said, um, the, the things that we have kind of requested. And I would I would move forward on it too. for first reading the next meeting thank you uh, yeah I'll move forward on it but I do want to see more a uh, detail better more detailed site plan and some of the plans for it and the tree I want to see some of the requirements and how they're going to be met and again we can condition that. some of those items which I think some of those we have but then uh, as I mentioned I think the final development master plan that that will come back for you once we have a, a builder I think it, it's difficult we could show anything right now, but till we get that builder, I think if we have a comprehensive list of what the issues are, when that builder comes to us, we'll address every one of those items and bring forth that final development PD master plan for you to review and consider all those yeah, that, that, issues. That plan kind of it's just freaked a me out a little plan. bit. I it's mean, a little, it, was, it's a it looked plan, like just really. a crammed in spot. I, I couldn't see how you're going to save trees. I didn't see hardly any open space. And again, when we get that tree survey from the and work with the builder, we can probably manipulate the orientation of those buildings. Yeah, to, an old order, you know. Know. Right. No. Go forward, but okay. I will be interested in how those develop. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, um, city manager report. Uh, I was asked to place this item on the agenda. I don't know if Councilman Spinner or Mayor Bonson would uh, yeah, like to. Yeah, I can address this. Um, this? Um, Councilman Spina is not able to do. Yeah, I was the appointed by Council as the alternate okay. to the MPO if Councilman Smith isn't there. Uh, MPO doesn't allow for alternates. So I didn't have a um, task, a I guess. Task. <laughs> and I have many tasks. So um, I approached Dr. Spina about that, that, um, you know, to see if that's something that he could take on, just that liaison piece. I'll still be involved in the foundation because I'm on the foundation board and the economic development because that's my passion. Um, but he's going to, if it's okay with you, take over that liaison role because I just kind of have a lot that I... We need to vote need a motion for that. We need a yeah, formal action. I think so. Yep. So okay. I'll, I'll I'll move that uh, Councilman Spina replace uh, 
Mayor, Bar, Mayor Munson, not Barr, sorry, was a few years ago, uh, as the, as the um, chamber liaison, liaison. And I'll second that. I have a motion and a second to uh, have Councilman Spina act as the liaison to the chamber. In replacement, replacement of Mayor Monson, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passed unanimously. Thank you. All right. We have come to the portion of a meeting where we have citizens' comments. Ms. Hillman, is anyone signed to speak? No, sir. All right. Doesn't look like anybody wants to get out of their seat at this point, but... Oh, wait a minute. Other, did you have anything else for your report? Mr. Dr. Stovall would like to speak. Well, hello, Dr. Stovall. Yeah, Randy Stovall. I'm, uh, for another three weeks, I guess, I'm chairman of the board, the Zephyr Hills Chamber. Um, I didn't put anything on the card because I didn't really know I was going to think of these things, but you talked about a number of issues today that I think uh, have some bearing here. One of them is I think you'd be happy to know that the Pasco County Transportation Safety Committee is going to meet in this room on June 26, and Chief Brewer is sending somebody from the police department who really works with traffic all the time, and they're the group that, that met with the mayor and Todd and some others to do that safety audit over on Geiger Road. So it's good to have them meeting here because we're going to have people from FDOT, um, the USF's um, Transportation Research Institute, and then the traffic ops people. Uh, there'll be somebody from the Highway Patrol, or usually there is, depends on what happens that day. But it's a good opportunity for us to get in front of them some more. So thank you, Chief, for getting us a rep for that. Um, a couple of other things I wanted to mention, the other transportation item, we talked a lot about Wire Road tonight, and um, I, think, I think, Steve, you said we're not on the list to get it done soon, but what is really close is a multipurpose trail for Wire Road, and I think you know this, the county did a preliminary study about that here a few months ago, <coughs> and I'm, I'm not happy that it's not on the funded list, but it's like the next project below the funding list where they drew the line. And so um, I, I'm pretty confident they're not gonna forget that project. Um, the transportation planner, it's, it's high on her, her agenda, I think. So maybe in another year, we'll get that into the funded list. Is that, is that something if the city were to partner on that project, it could slide up into the funded, well, we'll funded have to portion? Ask, we'll have yes. to ask that. Ever attend that safety meeting too. Yeah. Because I, I would well, they they come, yeah. Okay. Be good. The city, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I because I, I would, I would think that would be an important project for the city to partner with Pasco because we have and just I know all of you know this, but we have Abbott Park, we have a, you know the trail that runs along Abbott Park, you cross all the way down to Derry, you cross Derry, and then the kids are walking in the road. Um, you know, I've seen it personally, mm -hmm. 12, 15 kids walking to and from the high school. If we can get that half mile of sidewalk put in, it's a, it's a huge safety impact um, that I think would be worthwhile partnering with the county to try to get that project. Well, I think if you look forward. at that and partner with them and at the same time tell them we need turning lanes down right at that project too while you're partnering with them. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, and, and if, if maybe you, could, you, you or Todd or somebody could come to this safety meeting and just say that. I mean, yep. that might stimulate them. Yeah. That, that might qualify for, I don't, say for us to school, had, there, was a, there was a federal money available for that, so that something like that might qualify. It's a lot of effort mm -hmm. for little money. So I, oh, I, yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. The other thing I want to tell you is totally different, uh, but this kind of relates to transportation, and it, it is very fascinating, um, and it relates to these apartments you're talking about tonight. So there was an open house at the apartments just next to Publix. We just had that last week. And um, when we were doing the tour, uh, Mayor Monson and I were talking to the manager of that facility. This is, this is what really hit me. Almost, I don't know how many, but a large number of her first uh, renters. And she said they've got 80 apartments rented out of their 240 or whatever it is. So that's a pretty good start. They've only been available for a while, but most of those are coming from some other place. They don't live in Zephyr Hills. They didn't live in Zephyr Hills until they moved to those new apartments that drew them here. So to me, that's, that's very interesting data. It's not just shifting people around. And, you know, we all know those are very expensive apartments, but I guess 
that's a selling point for some people. So that's good news, and hopefully we'll know more before we have our economic summit, and we'll have better data for you on that, because I think they, they agreed to help us share that information. So that's all. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Randy. Um, mayor announcements. Yeah, and to piggyback off of what Dr. Stovall said is, you know, when we were over there, you know, I've, everybody knows I've had a kind of a little burr about that apartment place over there, but while we were there the other day, I, I was very impressed with the facility, what it, the quality of that facility. It's not for everybody. It's not for m most of our residents. Okay, but the sellable feature over there is that walking ability. They can walk right out their side gate, go to Publix, go to, to wherever they want right over there. And that is, that's a big selling point that they were talking about. So that, no matter how anybody feels about that complex over there, it is beautifully done and it does meet a need for a certain demographic of people. It's not for everybody, right? So, um, yeah, that was, an, that was an interesting night. And I wanted to thank, we have some residents here. They're not actually in the city. They're right at Hidden, Hidden River, um, Hidden Creek. Um, but I wanted to thank you for showing up at every time there's a mobility or a traffic. You guys come because we talked about this, the squeaky wheel. They live on Island Boulevard, and they are very vocal about they cannot get out of that subdivision in the winter and some of the summer now, too, but that that road has to get four-laned. And so I wanted to thank them. They have shown up at... Yeah, you just come up and state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. I would like to speak to and then I'm going. Phyllis Okay. Okay. My Go. name is Rich Lynch. I live on Sparrow Nest Way in Zephyr Hills. I wanted to thank Todd especially and you, Melanie, um, for giving us the opportunity. Um, and we appreciate uh, your support too. Um, the, the advancement of that whole area has just been unbelievable how it's exploded. Um, I had an opportunity to ride with Spectrum News um, last week. The story is going to air Wednesday um, throughout their day on their newscast uh, about the opportunities in our community. Um, we love it here. We really do. And I, I tried to be in a positive tone as I drove with this reporter. Excuse me. And um, I just said how exciting it is. and. I, Councilwoman, you mentioned something about the impact fees of all of these developments that are going, and my wife and I are so frustrated because all of these homes that are going in, there's like 400 in our community alone, these roads should have been built before all those homes because each home probably has two different drivers, so that's, you know, 500 cars that are coming out onto the road. And it's just that it seems like th there's a 10-year plan, a 15-year plan, you know, and I said the Rays can build a stadium in four years, yet we have five years to get a traffic light. And it's just so frustrating that it takes that long for these advancements to come after there's been accidents and, you know, a lot of hardship on people. So, I mean, I appreciate you guys, especially, like I say, Todd and you, Melanie, um, and Rod and, and Terry, the, the, the work that they've done. And so we just hope to see some of these advancements, and we would appreciate your support. We're going to keep pushing. That's, yeah. you know, I, I it's a county that. road, and we it's re county, we the state, it's the, Yes, the we recognize. Right. There's so many different moving parts, we understand, mm -hmm. and we appreciate mm -hmm. any support you guys can give us. So All right, thank you. Thank you. you. Thank you. And I think you've seen from some of our discussions, because I, I know you were at a meeting that I was at, uh, we had here with Transportation One a couple months ago. You had a lot of good points then, too. But as you can see in our discussions, we, we try to do as much as we can ahead of time. And then, it, like I said, it's just a, getting everything together. And it always lags. It always lags always for some does. reason. Always so. does. And was there Miss Phyllis that needed to say something? Yes, I did. Mike, can you hear me? Yes. State your name for us. And it's Phyllis Bruce. I'm, I'm at 8618 Gold. 
Um, my family has been on property for a very long time. The long and short of it is that I have been given a future land use of R4, which is how my family. I also have a realtor that works for Caldwell Banker that has a property listed, along with being a home, uh, the owner of the property, part of it, along with my uncles. Um, basically, I've never been able to sell it because it's been, in my opinion, misowned. It, I can't, the city tells I have heard, and I've been reaching out to the city repeatedly, and I've asked several times recently, and have not heard back from the city planner requesting a reapplication be made to change my zoning to a commercial because finally, finally, um, the commercial, the property that's right next to me, I know the end of town, um, they have been with the planning review board, and my understanding, I could be wrong, I'm waiting until next Wednesday, but is that they met all the requirements and that. I would like to apply for the same commercial benefit as they are, and I feel like I'm being dismissed. Okay. And I would really like to set up a pre application meeting, and I want this noted of the record. Okay, thank you, Ms. Phyllis. And um, I, I see City Planner is going, he's going to meet with you. You please reach out to him and City. I have my Yes, okay. And City Manager, you, they heard. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. Appreciate it. All right. And the only other couple of things I have, because I know we're late, is um, we had a great Memorial Day remembrance um, at the park. It was very well put together. PIO did a great job to, to promote that. And it, we had twice twice or three times the amount of people there this time than we've had in the past. And, and thank your crew for putting for helping out there. I don't know if you guys put up the tents or if they did, but I appreciated you guys doing all that. Uh, and it was, and when I said thank you to the people, a lot of people came up afterwards and said, we didn't know about this every year. So now that they know about it, they'll be back every year. And then on Friday, there's a flag day celebration at the Elks Club. I'm leaving on vacation tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. So if anyone could be there, if you'd reach out to me uh, and take my place there, that would be great, okay? I'll find out exactly. I think it's at 11 a.m., but I'll find out. Everything from You've got it. Okay, if you could just do that for me. That's all I have. Thank you. All right, uh, city manager? I have nothing. City attorney? Nothing for me. City Council, I'll start on with Councilman Smith. Well, thank you, Mr. President. A um, couple things. Um, uh, about the city manager evaluation, I, I'm glad we're doing it. Um, I, I think we look at it as, as an opportunity to um, constructively evaluate the city manager. It's not a, it's not a time to thrash on somebody, but, it, but it's to give some real thought and an honest opinion of ways that not just city manager, but we can kind of improve as a team. You know, that, that's the way I view it. Um, so I, I'm glad we're going forward with that. The apartment complex, I think that's a great, it's a, it's a great asset. I think it's density, and it's density in the right place. You can walk places. So density in the right place is, is not a bad thing. Um, I had a, a picture sent to me uh, that was taken at 3.30 right in front of City Hall here, and the sprinklers were on. Um, and... I, and I know, I, I know sometimes timers get off, I know that, but we need to try and limit that. Yes, yeah, so if you, I'm sure all of you did, you saw Matt and I were talking for a good portion of the beginning of the meeting. That was the discussion. Um, it is on reclaimed water. It doesn't matter. It, well, that and, doesn't matter. And there are rules on that, and I was not aware of that. And so public works director has already is looped in we've texted back and forth so that will be addressed tomorrow morning first thing and 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 as a city we need to set the standard we need to just go above the standard in in this in landscape design in irrigation and in, ma in maintenance i just feel that if we don't set the standard why should we ask somebody to follow it you know so um but and and i know i do know timers get off i get it i get it but we got to be on top of that stuff because, um, you, you know, it, it, somebody's going to say, "Why can't I? 
I, why can't I water, you know? And it really, and I understand reclaim is different because I know you can water twice on reclaim, but There's still somebody doesn't know, somebody doesn't know it's reclaim, you know? And you certainly shouldn't be watering at 3.30. Right. So that's all. You're on it. We're yep. going to address it. Good, good. <laughs> Nothing for me, thank you. I have a couple things. Um, <clears throat> can I get an update on what's going on with Cruising Field and the um, pavilion and the coverage? Look at our public works director. Good evening, Shane LeBlanc, public works director. Also the responsible party for the irrigation, so we're going <laughs> to... Take care of that tomorrow. I think we have a timer issue. So be assured we'll take care of that. But the cruising, you're talking about the shade structure. We're waiting to get a proposal from the engineering company that I was in contact with the gentleman last week. And he's going to send a proposal. I should be getting that any time now. So we'll know how much it's going to cost and what the conceptual design plans are going to look like. Okay, and could you push, I mean, it's not going to be in for summer, obviously. Will it be in for this fiscal year, since it's budgeted this fiscal year? As long as we get the, the proposal and the, we can pull the PO, and then the, the dollars will be encumbered. Once we get it, we can go, because it's a source well <coughs> contract, so we don't have to go through the whole bid process. So we can pull the, the PO, issue the PO, and um, get on their schedule. If you don't hear from them, can you call them? Mm -hmm. okay. you know, I just talked to him this this week. Today's <coughs> this week. So you talked to him today? Not today, no. Yeah. Uh -huh. well, I'll work on it. And can I get an update on um, what's happening with the closing at the home theater? Has that closed? Yes. Yes. Transaction? You mean? The transaction? Yeah. Closing yep. transaction. Yes. Yep. So it's owned by Main Street now? It is. Correct. Okay. Um, what are, how are we going to handle the, or the design and the, some of the improvements of the home theater? Um, I think that's probably better answered by Main Street. There, I need them to be here in the room, um, part of that conversation, because they're they're the lead agency on that. And is the city going to contribute funds to the improvements to That's up the to theater? council. If council decides to, then we will. Okay. Can we be included in the loop of what's being done with it and the improvements and what's planned? Right now there's... Before there's anything's a, done and torn down or anything? So the first, so the first uh, appropriation or the appropriation from the state currently is 1.25 million, you know, the purchase price. Um, and there's currently a second appropriation request that's in. Um, I don't know the status of that. I know that the governor's looking at the budget currently. Um, and I believe that's another 1.25 million that was requested. Uh, so two and a half million dollars for that that's allocated, well, potentially two and a half million dollars that's allocated to Main Street. So, so Dr. Spina, from, from the original pro, uh, appropriation, then there's about five or six hundred thousand left. Right. Uh, Dr. Spina, um, as the council liaison to Main Street, I just wanted to let you know that I have actually asked to have a meeting with uh, the board and and have a call in to um, Senator Burgess to offer my assistance, and we'll hopefully be able to provide an update to you to, at the next meeting. Okay. And real quick, like didn't didn't the CRA? Uh, didn't we contribute something from the CRA towards that too? It, in the budget in the current year. So I, I don't remember what that dollar amount So was. as a CRA commission, we should have, that will give you, you know, I guess access to I have input. Budget, yeah. I mean, I think the facade has been painted. I think the building has been painted. Uh, you know, I think they just cleaned it up and everything, but there's a lot left to be done on the interior, and they've just started. Yeah. So there's a dollar amount, just to clarify, there was a dollar mm -hmm. amount that was budgeted, budgeted from yeah. the CRA, but nothing okay. has been done from Edit. that account or committed at, right. at this point. But we just, That's my yeah. understanding. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I guess I'll just go on the record saying that I've, I'd, I would prefer council be advised of anything before anything's 
major is done, any structural changes is done to that building, I'd like council to be informed. Okay. And uh, just real quick, like just uh, Councilman Smith, I think you're right, we need to set the example. Um, and also for our employees, I just kind of hit me as we were talking about it. So I don't know if any employees were walking by that, but hopefully, I don't know, maybe come up with some kind of little reward system for if they see anything around yes. town that, yes. that to go ahead and say something. It could be anybody that says something. Somebody from the library could say, hey, why is the sprinklers on or something, you know. So we, we maybe encourage the employees and if we have to, like, Give them a little, ins a little incentive for for, yeah. do, for doing those types of things. Um, that yeah. So, anyways, and that's all I have, and I will adjourn the meeting.